Thank you. Uh -huh. So Chiemi is an award-winning documentary director and producer who founded Isotope Films in 2007 to de develop and produce character-driven nonfiction content for all media. Recent credits include AKA Jane Rowe, Amazing Grace, Blue Note Records, Beyond the Notes, Love Gilda, Elaine Stritch, Shoot Me, which she also directed, and The Be Betrayal, Nera Coon, which garnered an Oscar nomination and won the Emmy Award for Nonfiction Filmmaking. Her films have premiered at Sundance, Berlin, and Venice Film Festivals, and have been distributed by FX Networks, HBO, Netflix, Amazon, iTunes, Hulu, PBS, and OWN. Thank you, Chiemi. And then we also have Mike Martin, who's now 23 and since making the film, he's had a beautiful daughter, um, is studying math to earn his GED and has gotten the opportunity to speak at events like South by Southwest, traveled to Nashville and spoken at the Museum of the City of New York. So I'll give you a virtual applause for being here. <laughs> Thank you. Great. So I have a few questions that I'm gonna start off with and then we'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes for audience questions. So feel free to type questions that you have along the way and we'll get to those later. Um, so I wanna start off by talking with you, Mike. Um, so it's clear in the film that your time at Rikers has had a significant impact on your life. How has art, music and filmmaking aided in your transition out of Rikers and your general personal growth? How have these creative outlets provided you with new opportunities in your personal life since the film has premiered? Um, well, basically, this like opened up the fact that like as coming up, we like we kind of don't like express our feelings. We're not, you know, when we go to school. We don't talk to like certain people. We don't get to express ourselves. So yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, she like, it's like, we don't get to express ourselves and nothing like that. So it's coming up, we go to school, we come home, we do our work, probably go home. I mean, go in our rooms and play video games. You know, we get bored, we go hang out with friends. And, you know, it's like, it's it's little opportunities here and there, like to play basketball here. You probably got certain extracurricular activities, but it's like stuff that certain people will see that fits them or maybe they want to, you know, be adventurous and adapt to new things and see how other things turn out, you know, but we, uh, we as a, us, as in not just black men, but as in school wise, like some schools weren't able to pay for certain things. So we wouldn't have certain things coming up. And like, that probably is what probably gave us the idea or maybe gave me the idea of not thinking is not that many opportunities until maybe I probably get older in life or maybe it's not any opportunities at all. I could probably just do this, do that, go to work and come home and just be a regular normal nine to five man, but never thought that I can actually produce a film and show people things about my life and actually get people to, you know, come on board with me and help me out and show me things that I probably never even know. And like, like someone always told me, knowledge is definitely power. So everything I take from everybody that I probably learned from, whether they was a mentor or not, older people in my life, they show me things I've seen. I've seen things I know different. And I know right from wrong. Sometimes we do make our mistakes here and there, but this life is not like, you're not gonna cook your food and not mistakenly slice your finger and have to put a Band-Aid on it, you know? So I would like to say, I definitely think these as blessings. Because, you know, it's not easy for young people to, you know, come up like the way I did. And it's not, some people just need the, the extra advice and the help in hand. So, you know, they can connect, they can feel what you feel. And it's not like they have to go through it to feel this, like your hurt and your sympathy. They could just like feel your energy and your vibe off of it. Great, thank you. And you mentioned helping hand and one of those aspects is part of the goals of Buy Kids is giving people like you young people a helping hand in telling their stories. And so that leads into my question for Chiemi, which is um, Buy Kids, you know, role is to help put the camera in the hands of young people. So how do you feel your role in this film differed from other films that you've been involved with? And what did you learn from this experience? Well, um, first of all, I, I just think it's an, an incredible organization um, that Holly Carter began and, and conceived of. 
And um, so she solicits filmmakers to come in and help other kids tell their stories. And I think, so my role in documentary, I'm usually directing or producing. And in this situation, I was producing and, and helping facilitate Mike to become his own storyteller, his own director. Um, and I think along with Hollis Memminger, who's now um, a, an award-winning cinematographer, um, we were able to help Mike, teach Mike how to learn to use the camera, um, how to mic people, like literally mic people, talk about aspects of his life that he could film. Um, we gave him a GoPro to keep at his home so that when he was inspired, he could, you know, shoot himself or, you know, shoot from his own perspective, aspects of his daily life. I think he, he shot an amazing um, sort of sunset of his, the view from the top of his apartment building, the trains running, um, clouds. He shot himself making dinner um, and was able to really capture intimate details of his own life. And I think one of our favorite things was when he filmed an interview um, of his grandmother who raised him and was the interviewee, the cinematographer, um, and you know, ultimately the filmmaker. So he got to be the author of his own story. So, I mean, I learned so much from working with Mike and I think a lot of that was just spending so much time with him in his day-to-day -day life. You learn what it was to grow up in his neighborhood, um, what that experience may have been like, the challenges of you know, being independent at such a young age, taking care of yourself, um, what it was like to be on the street. You know, we, we, I think Mike and Hollis and I, when we got to sit around and like have breakfast together or set up cameras together, he, he would tell us, you know, details of what that was like in his life and being able to help him learn how to interview um, and tell us intimately details about Rikers and what that whole experience um, meant to him was, you know, a huge education that I couldn't have gotten anywhere except for, you know, working hand in hand with Hollis and Mike, putting this, helping him visualize the story. Um, so it was incredible. It was an incredible experience. And I feel like we learned as much as filmmakers and storytellers as Mike learned about making a film. Great. And were there any challenges that either of you had in the filmmaking process that you wanted to talk about? What, what was hard for you about this film, Mike? Um, basically, what was really hard about it was the fact of expressing and being on camera. It wasn't something I never did before, so it was like, all right. And then when y'all told me it'd be like public, public, I don't know how to get the word out, but you know, public, public lot. When you get it out, I can't get the word out because, you know, when it gets out on TV and stuff like that. Uh, right. When yeah, it's was, yeah, was six. Yeah. yeah. Basically, yeah. I was like, all right. Um, <laughs> it was kind of tough. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do it because it's something new. And it was like, it was probably a way for me to, turning into the man I am today now, because I like never really like to sit there and express myself or talk about anything. So yeah. I think, I was just... yeah, I, I think er, definitely early on when we would interview him, he would, I, I feel like Mike, you were very reticent to be completely honest about your experience because as you said in the movie, you didn't want to be labeled a certain way and only seen a certain way. And I think that to me made, reminded me that you understood the power of media, like how you are at 19 in your life or 18 or 17 when you're incarcerated might not be who you are for the rest of your life. And yet that story is gonna live on a film somewhere. So I think that's really an important part of storytelling is that one of the most amazing things about Mike is that he got to look at his own story and be able to comment on it as the author of the story and the director of the story he got to say what he wanted to say. So you're not only seeing somebody who 
you did time at Rikers, but you're getting to learn all the emotions and all the circumstances of a young man that that would happen to, and also see the wisdom that was gleaned from being able to look at it in retrospect. And that's kind of one of the beautiful things of storytelling. But, you know, early on, I think when we were asking you to tell us your story, I felt like there was a certain level of trust that we had to um, have before you would go into any detail. Is that, does that sound right? Yeah, just, just about it. Yeah. It, and, you know, we had to, we had to get to know each other and trust each other, just like any, you know, any circumstance where you're going to be spilling your guts about your own experience to a stranger, you know, I think to me, that was, that was certainly a challenge. I think Hollis and I, after we would go film with you, we would sit in the car and talk. And this is something that we've never, I've never said, but we would talk about the kinds of feelings that might be going through your mind and, and why it was hard for you to sort of describe, you know, your experience to us, even though you knew that that's a part of the film, that that was a part of the story. And um, I think that Hollis and I feel sort of like we were your parents or peers in a way, like we're trying to be really protective of your process, but we also really wanted to know your story. And so we kept coming back and coming back. And I think eventually, you know, you're like, okay, they're not gonna leave me alone until I tell them my story. Um, and I think that was a challenging aspect of it is like, you're never made to do that in real life. People don't sit you down and go, okay, tell me all about yourself, you know? Um, and that was brave of you. And I think like, I'm so proud and inspired because every time you take the film somewhere, you can talk about it with that perspective and help other kids realize that, you know, your, your journey starts here, but it doesn't have to end here. It can go on and on and on, you know? Great, and I wanna make sure we get to some audience questions because we have some really great ones here. So Elisabetta asks, how was music able to give you an outlet to express yourself and your creativity, Mike? Uh, it gave me an outlet to express myself because I mean, at my age, when I was about that age coming up and going through prison and records, a lot of people listen to music. So it's like, I could have I could have probably expressed myself through art and painting, but they wouldn't have got this, like the image of what I was trying to tell them. But like, they wouldn't have got what they was trying to get from me, like the story I was trying to give out to them. So I figured music would be better because one, I always came up from music, everybody like listen to music, hip hop, R&B, whether it's rock music or just regular beats and soft melody tracks. We like always listen to me. Well, I always listen to music, like no matter what I do, whether it's cooking, cleaning, playing the game or whatever I'm doing, I'm probably listening to music. I'm outside listening to music. So I figured that was probably my way to express it. And I always love music. So I figured I'd probably put myself into, put myself into lyrics and describe things that I've done and probably that other kids and may have came up doing like skipping school. Uh, you know, you wasn't supposed to put your hand in the cookie jar, you know, you're breaking the rules and stuff. So, and then you obviously learn in life that stuff that you wasn't supposed to be doing that you now know, you know the right from wrong. So you know not to stick your hand in the cookie jar. You know not to skip school because you obviously want that bachelor's degree or that master. So that's how I felt, that's how I felt music was the best opportunity to, to describe it. Great. Um, Mike asks, how long was Mike in Rikers? How did his grandmother get him out? Well, Mike, <laughs> um, <laughs> I was in there for about, five months I came home in between but then I got rearrested over like this a little bullshit it was like it was lame it was like fireworks and stuff like that because you know we was trying to have fun on the 4th of July so I wound up doing five months in total and then when I came home I didn't I didn't have bail because my grandmother wasn't working at the time she was just getting into her retirement so it was obviously bail wasn't an option for me, especially $20,000. So I figured I just, you know, hold out, 
see what goes on. And, you know, she was back and forth to court every court date, you know, giving whatever she could, you know, good documents saying like stuff that I've done, probably like what I probably accomplished in, you know, elementary school, middle school and stuff like that. She, you know, she gave that to my lawyer and my lawyer got me a program. Thank you. Um, next, Dawn asks, are you still in touch with folks from Rikers? If so, what do you tell them? Uh, repeat that. Are you still in touch with folks from Rikers? If so, what do you tell them? Um, I'm in touch with a few people. It's not a lot because it wasn't like so many people. It's Rikers is mixed. So it's like every borough, Manhattan, Bronx, Queens, Staten Island. It's all in like one county jail and that's Rikers. So it's only a certain amount of people I would know and people I probably met on the inside, just like meeting them all for the strength of being inside. But either as in people I known in jail, I probably not known not one of them. I've probably met most of them inside. So I, you know, I see them from time to time. Some of them are doing good. Some of them, you know, here and there with a little, it's not, it's not that bad, but you know, they make, they still make their mistakes here and there, you know, what they think they got going on. But it's not like, I tell them, you know, it's sometimes you gotta like, for me as in like a hood perspective and like coming from the hood, I tell them like, sometimes you gotta separate yourself. You gotta, you know, leave, just not leave everybody including your family, you know, just separate yourself for some time, you know, take a good six months, seven months, find out what you wanna do, you know, whether you want a job, you want to, a lot of them like to do music. So you want to, you want to, you know, go sit in the house, you know, relax. You know, I know a lot of people like to, you know, smoke their herb and stuff, you know. So write, write your music down, you know, chill out, hang out. You don't, it's trouble free. You ain't getting in no trouble for writing music. So just, you, you pour out what you're saying from the inside. Did you meet, um, what, what was his name? Joshua in... Rikers, the, the artist who also had the recording studio? Um, you know, the cello player who... Oh, um, Jacob. Jacob. Jacob no, Jacob I, met, Jacob I met at Friends of Island. Okay. That was so after I came... Yeah, that was after I came home. But did, he also does art therapy at Rikers, right? Didn't he go there and, and teach music therapy? Yeah, he did. He did for some time. Yeah. So the, the gentleman in the movie who was playing cello did all the illustrations of inmates. He also taught at the academy, the school that Mike went to after Rikers and um, they collaborated, right? On some of your hip hop. Yeah, so I did some music with him. I did a few, uh, probably like two or three tracks, but it wasn't nothing too serious. It was like just to play around. Yeah. I did one with uh, um, Derek. I'm not sure if you know him. Front desk, oh, yeah, always yeah, our yeah. friends. Yeah. I did one with Derek, and that was probably about it. Cause then he started, he had started his uh stuff with Rikers, so he wouldn't be there as much after school to you know help out with the booth and everything. Right. Um, Lisa asks for both of you, what is what inspires you now? Uh, what inspires me now is. I mean, it, it could be more than multiple things, but just what inspires me now is just to see like the things, not just as like say in the spoiling, just like to show my daughter and stuff, the things that I didn't know, like very like just exposing her to young, I mean, excuse me, exposing her to stuff at a young age, like, you know, going out for dinners and, you know, going on little vacation trips and just family time, hanging out with her grandmother while she, I mean, her great grandmother, and you know stuff like that. So she she knows as a young teenager the stuff that she's supposed to do and what she's not supposed to do. That way I don't have to be in her mix. Hey, what are you doing? You know you're supposed to do your homework or you know getting into her business. You know what she do at work or whatever at school. You know she become young. She's smart already, so I, I believe she become young and smart. So that's the one thing that inspires me the most is to make sure that she does better than I did. Okay. Jimmy? Uh, uh, for me, what, what inspires me now, probably what inspired me um, all along is really 
learning about people's stories and figuring out a way to turn them into some narrative or format that, that other people can learn about them. Um, I just feel like we all have so much in common that's not really exploited. And, and it's very easy to look at people a certain way and really not know what's behind everything. And I think, you know, a story like Mike's story is a perfect example. When I started working with Mike, my brother was incarcerated and he was released, you know, shortly after the film came out. And I just think that there's always a story behind a story. And, uh, you know, there, the channels of expressing that, whether it be music or filmmaking, are always worthwhile because we're just learning more about other people and, and ourselves. And the next question is what visions do you have for the criminal justice system after your experience? Um, well, what I would like to see probably is mostly fairness because when I was there, it wasn't, I mean, because what I, I don't know now because I haven't, you know, actually been inside or known, seen anybody that's been in and out right now. So I don't know actually what's going on, especially with the whole COVID thing and stuff like that. So I'm not sure what's going on now, but just like, just like better, like routine, like instead of, you know, being so hostile coming to work. Cause I always say like, when I, like, even when I go to work, I say it all the time, my coworkers and stuff. I say like, if you come to work angry at something that happened, you know, yesterday or something that just happened at home or, you know, and you just shouldn't be at work. Take the day off. Like it's no point. Like, cause in that, in that, in that line of work with corrections, you don't know exactly what could happen. You know, anything can go down at any given time, whether it's dangerous or you know nonviolent. Anything can go down. So, you know, people intend to go to work. You know, maybe angry, upset, and they feel the need to probably take it out, or maybe. The teenagers too, it's, just, it's vice versa. It's not just corrections, some of the teenagers too. So like they may be upset that, you know, they didn't get what they wanted yesterday. So now they wanna, you know, be upset, wanna fight and, you know, do things that they are not supposed to do, but it's not they fault. It's the fact that they was upset or they was angry at maybe something that happened. And I would say, like, I just figured like they should, they should express themselves more, you know, like, like, even though y'all come from a different field, you know, just because you're correction and this is your job, like, actually get to know the kids inside there. Like, actually know, hey, I know John, he's from Harlem. Mm -hmm. Steve is from Queens, you know. Yeah. I know some of their family members, you know, stuff like that. Like, get to know some of them instead of, you know, because when I was there, they would just probably send in the officer, the officer sit on the tear till the shift is over, probably switch out to the bubble, go to lunch, but most most CEOs wouldn't actually get involved with some of the inmates. Like they don't they wouldn't chat with them and stuff like that. They just be on their job. You mean they they don't treat them like humans. They don't treat them like you know. Really yeah, stuff like that. It's, yeah, I, I also think the deprivatization of prisons. You know, people making money off of the prison system is not incentive um, for for the inmates to be better people. It's it's incentive for you know, private organizations to make money off of imprisonment, which is sickening. What we should be doing is helping the people on the inside you know, rehabilitate themselves um, through mental health programs, um, rehabilitation programs. It should be an opportunity for people to enhance themselves, not recycle and you know, undermine what problems that already exist. Um, it just seems like such a shame that that hasn't been more an agenda of our of our government up until this point. Um, Andrew's asking, where can I find Mike Martin's music? Um, you could, I have one song now that's up on SoundCloud. It's actually the master version of Skipping School, so it probably sounds better in the audio that I got that's yeah seen up online today. But I have that on SoundCloud. Um, you can search as P-O-P-T-H-A-O-P-P. -P. Again, P-O-P-T-H-A-O-P-P. -P. 
Great. Um, next question is from Hattie. What advice do you have for young people today? Uh, what I would say is probably like, you know, sometimes, you know, we don't all have, you know, mom and dad or, you know, mom, dad, and grandma. But I would say to like, I'm not sure. Can you, you guys see me? Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Yeah. All right. Um, I would say, like, you know, instead of, you know, coming home and, you know, just hitting the sack and going in the room, play the game and stuff, you know, I actually sit there and talk. Like, don't just only talk to your parents. Talk to, like, older people, friends. Get it, like, older people would, like, get advice from everyone, not just just the good and not the bad and just get advice from the bad and not the good. Get advice from, you know, both sides. It's always both sides to the story, so... I would say, you know, talk more, express a lot more and, you know, show the love that we got now because at the end of the day, we all live to see 80, 90 and then we go on elsewhere. So it's like we got to share and love the time we got now and always cherish the value that we have. Never put the bad over the good. Um, and I think. Our final question is from Holly. Why was Chiami interested in making this film? And then how can we continue to support Mike and other kids like him? Um, I, Holly reached out to me as a documentary filmmaker. And I think Mike's story in particular struck me because my own brother was incarcerated. And um, you know, I knew that somebody like my brother would never have an opportunity to tell the story that would be broadcast to millions of people. And I felt like, you know, there's a lot of similarity in anybody that, that is incarcerated. And um, we met Mike Hollis Meminger, my filmmaking partner and I met Mike at Friends of Island Academy after he'd already um, spent some time there after his release. And he was clearly a star. He was very open to um, being on camera he was very open to learning how to, how to use a camera. And, um, you know, he had all kinds of ideas. So um, that's kind of how it all went down. And we knew as soon as we met him that he was somebody that we'd like to um, help him, help facilitate him telling his own story. Um, so that's, it, you know, it's what I love to do. I love to, um, tell character-driven stories in which you really learn about somebody else's experience, so. And do you guys have any notes about how we can continue to support Mike, um, people who are in similar situations as you? Well, I, I think one, one thing is by kids, um, the foundation and Friends of Island Academy, which um, the URL is on the screen, Friends of Island Academy um, Mike, you can talk more about this, but they actually um, went into Rikers and solicited young people that wanted to continue having an education once they came out. So Mike was accepted into this program and it helped him um, get his GED and also learn skills to get a job and have, oppor have opportunities. Is that right, Mike? Yes. In terms of the mission of Friends of Academy. Um, and he talks about it in the, in the show, in the film as well. So one way I'd say to help kids like Mike or, you know, men like Mike um, is to contribute and support Friends of Island Academy's mission, because I do think that that helped him um, have a pipeline once he got out of Rikers to, to you know, figure out how to focus his skills and his education on getting a job. And it, it's how we found him. Um, it's how by kids found subject um, to make the story about. So what do you think about Friends of Island Academy, Mike? Um, well, just for starters, cause I, like I said, I came home to a program, like I said earlier, I came home to a program that was willing to take me for, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 10, six months, if I'm not mistaken. And as I like got enrolled there, they took me to like find me a new school, you know, change the environment from the school I was already in. 
basically they would just like come in, check up on me. It was like a it was like a mini probation, but it wasn't probation. They were just like same way you guys would come in, check up on me, make sure I'm doing good, see what I was doing for the week. And then now we go out to go film, but it just wasn't filming with that. It was just basically what I was doing and stuff. I got in from there. And then once I finished into five to six months, I transferred over to Friends of Ireland because I went around May to like check it out to see what it was about and stuff. Right. And I figured it was closer. So I'm like, all right, I could do this. I could get my high school diploma or my GD here. And I could probably get something out of here, you know, make sure I could be well being and not end up back in the same place I was. So as an I as I got into friends, I started to meet a couple people like Mo. Uh it was funny because we had Miss Mo, we had Mo, me at Miss Poe. It was it's a bunch of people, Anthony, the artist, teacher, uh Chris, the organization owner, and John. We had people like that you know, to talk to us, they put in like little programs here and there to come speak to us about little workshops. But one thing they did help me out with was like, they like showed me how to create resumes. I did interviews with teachers. They showed me how to like take my experiences and like show other people how to do things like, all right, you know, you know, Mike coming here, you know, you tell them, yo, y'all gotta make sure y'all make your hot chocolate or y'all coffee. Y'all got whatever is in the fridge. You know, we got group later on. Uh, Deanna and uh, Gina, pianoist, they told me how to do the piano a little bit here and there. They had that talent show where you, where you wrote that. Your rock. Yep, the talent, yep, the talent show. And what about painting that mural in Harlem? That was through uh, SYP that I obtained through uh, Friends of Island Friends. also. Yeah. So, I feel like they connected you to so many interesting opportunities and programs when you were there. Basically, yes. Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mike and Chiemi, for being here and sharing all this really great information. It's really great to see you after watching the film. Um, so for everyone watching, if you head back to the Raphael Center page where you clicked play, you'll see that there is some extra bonus content with some of Mike's music. There's also some performances, some spoken word poetry as well. It's really great and such a gift for us to be able to have access to that. Um, you can also find more resources from Teach with and by Kids, so tehub.org or by Kids um, that has educational resources for classrooms or just personal learning as well if you want to learn more about this topic matter and thanks again for everyone and we hope to see you at our next event thank you Jimmy and Mike again for joining us thanks Kenya very nice to meet you it was great thank yeah. you Kenya and thank everybody for coming out and watching the zoom tonight awesome